Well, last week, if you were here in any of our services at West Campus, I mentioned that back in August, I was able to take a trip to the Boundary Waters in Minnesota. Anybody ever been up there? Way up north of Minnesota, between Minnesota and Canada? Put the, put the first picture up there. Have it? It's just gorgeous, beautiful. It's a sunset on the lake, just, just, just beautiful. One of my sons and uh, joined several of his friends and a few older guys like me, and seven of us spent three days camping, fishing, and, you know, just living the dream. That is, if by dream you mean sleeping on the ground, uh, coating yourself with enough mosquito repellent to kill a moose, and living in exactly the same clothes, exactly the same clothes for 72 hours. That's what we did. But that's living the dream. We had a great time, although both my son and I uh, lack certain outdoor skills. And I've talked about this in the past. For example, we don't know a whole lot about fishing. We fished, but we don't know a whole lot about fishing. Personally, I can't touch either worms or fish. Just a thing I have, unless I'm wearing gloves. You see here, if you watch carefully, I'm, I'm holding a fish there that I caught. He's facing you, but I'm wearing my fishing gloves, big giant fishing gloves, so I don't have to actually have to touch the fish. Um, we don't have much experience in uh, camping either, although we did learn how to set up tents on this trip, which made us both feel like Daniel Boone. But one of the things I could do is I could build a fire. Like most men, I have a little 10-year-old pyromaniac living inside my head. So I took it on myself to do what I could, so I would try to stoke up the fire every day because we had to have the campfire going all day long. But by the end of the second day, it had already started to rain, and everything got wet throughout the day. And we'd already burned all the, the, the logs and sticks that were left there by previous campers and that were dry and that we could find easily. So now we're trying to burn the wet stuff. And it's just not going very well. End of the second day. Fire keeps dying out, so I'm sitting there in a camping chair near the fire because I'm taking it on as my responsibility. You know, I'm the fire guy. And I'm blowing on the fire, trying to get it to... Because I know that... I don't really know why, but fire seems to do well with oxygen. So I'm, I'm blowing. <laughs> I'm blowing, and it, just nothing happening. It would flame a little bit and it would die out. And then one of the other guys comes up, a young guy, one of the kids. He's early 20s. Walks up and goes, hey, hey, Mr. Coffey, why don't you do it? try this? And he, he's standing like three feet further away from the fire than me. And he, he does something with his lips. He like pinches them together and he goes, <laughs> and he blows like this jet stream of air from further away than I am. And the flame just goes, whoosh, and it burns up into a, into a flame. So I spend like the next two days trying to go, <laughs> and I just, I, just, I just couldn't do it. I found that I really couldn't do that either. So we are talking tonight about a story from Acts that also involves wind and fire, but in a completely different way. We're in the second week of our series called Beginnings, Reaching the World. And if you were here last week and you know we're launching a year-long preaching series from the great book of Acts in the New Testament. We're preaching 40 straight weeks other than Christmas and Easter out of the book of Acts. And so we prepared for you these little things called the book of Acts journal. They're available in the back. They're free or you can just drop in a $3 donation if you can. But pick one up. We want you to have this all year long. It has the entire text of Acts in it. It's got pages to write notes. So you don't have to try to mess around with the back of the, of, of the bulletin and all that. Just pick one up. It can be your personal journal through Acts because we think it's an exciting book. It's full of all kinds of detail, and it applies to us here today. Last week, chapter 1, we saw that Jesus gave a mandate before he went back into heaven. He said, you will be my witnesses and then he promised power. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then he told them to wait for that to happen. Stay here in Jerusalem, and then you'll be baptized by the Holy Spirit, he said. All that's in chapter 1. Today we pick up chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 1. So I'll put the verses on the screen and let me read them for you. We're going to read Acts 2, 1 through 12. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together together in one place. Let me pause there before I continue. Uh, we're going to talk more about Pentecost in just a moment, what it means, but it was a major Jewish religious festival, and it took place every year about seven weeks after Passover. And remember that Jesus had uh, appeared to his followers for some 40 days following uh, Passover, followers following his resurrection. That's about uh, six weeks or so. And so he told them to wait in Jerusalem, then he ascended. So we're in that time period between Jesus' ascension and Pentecost, which was 
uh, 50 days. And so it, we're about a week after Jesus went into heaven. So that's what's happening. They've been waiting for about a week or 10 days. And we'll, we'll continue. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. At this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? We're going to stop there. First thing we see in chapter 2 here is the coming of the Spirit, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Way back in 1982, and some of you will remember me telling parts of the story in the past, I traveled to China with a Christian basketball team sponsored by a group called Sports Ambassadors. Uh, we were one of the very first Western Christian groups to go into China after it opened up following the Cultural Revolution of Mao. Uh, late one night while in, I think, Shanghai, maybe, maybe it was Beijing, uh, we were in a hotel, and I met an Egyptian student in the hallway of our hotel. Uh, this was a young man studying graduate studies in China for some reason. And he and I got into a conversation late at night about our respective religions. Uh, and he was a devout Muslim. I had never met a Muslim man before. And I was curious because I knew very little about that faith at that time. I was about 25 years old, and he was the same. So as we talked throughout the night, I remember that whenever I talked about God he would talk about Allah. When I would talk about Jesus, he would talk about the prophet Muhammad. When I would talk about the Bible, he would talk about the Quran. And when I talked about prayer, he talked about praying on his knees five times a day at the five set times for prayer in Islam. But then somewhere along the way, as it got very late at night, early in the morning, I happened to say something about the Holy Spirit, and he stopped me. He said, go back. What, what is that? What is that, the Holy Spirit? And so I did my best to explain. I said something like, and I can't remember exactly, the Holy Spirit is the risen Jesus in spiritual form who lives in our hearts by faith. The Holy Spirit teaches, guides, and assures us that we are loved by God. And the Egyptian student, I don't remember his name, thought for a moment, and then he looked at me and he said, no, no, we have nothing like that in Islam. We have nothing like that. And that's true. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity, God, Father, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in particular, sets Christianity apart as absolutely unique among the religions of the world. In fact, there's a book, new book out, and I, I ordered it just the other day. I saw it advertised in Leadership Magazine uh, called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, written by an American Muslim convert to Christianity describing his journey of faith. Very interesting. I can't wait to read it. Last week, we introduced the Holy Spirit like this. We said the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. That is, God has eternally existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, God the Father, sovereign creator of all things. God the Son, Jesus, the incarnate God who gave himself as the final sacrifice for our sins. God the Holy Spirit as the presence and power of the risen Christ who dwells in the heart of every believer and in the body of Christ, his church. Jesus had promised back in uh, John chapter 14, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper or advocate or counselor to be with you forever. He's talking about the Spirit. He then said the Spirit would remind them of all he had taught and would guide them into truth. Before Jesus, John the Baptist referred to the coming of the Spirit himself. In Luke chapter 3, he says, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, talking about Jesus, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Before John the Baptist, the prophet Joel, some 400 years before, 
wrote, And afterward I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. And before that, way back in Genesis chapter 1, we read, In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. What I want you to see in that quick trip backward through Scripture is that the Spirit of God has been there all along as promise or as part of God's nature. The Spirit of God was superintending the birth of all creation at the beginning of time. And here... In chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is superintending the birth of the church. So, back in chapter 1, when Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem, that they would be baptized by the Spirit, this is the baptism he's talking about. This is the fulfillment of all those promises that the Holy Spirit would come. Now, let's look for a moment at timing. Timing. It says, when the day of Pentecost arrived... They were all together in one place. Now, if you go back into the Old Testament, you see that the Jews called this particular feast either the Feast of the Harvest or the Feast of Weeks. Pentecost is a Greek word that was put over top of the Hebrew name for this festival because Pentecost is the word for 50th. Pentecost was a celebration of the beginning of the wheat harvest, which was 50 days after the barley harvest, which meant that Pentecost almost always fell in the middle of May, uh, maybe, as early as, maybe as late as the early June. And since 50 days is seven weeks, it always came a week of weeks after uh, the, 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 the celebration of first fruits, which was the barley harvest, which meant That's why they called it the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Weeks. Now, a couple of things about Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. Pentecost was a pilgrim festival. That meant, according to Jewish law, all adult Jewish men, and you can assume, therefore, their families, traveled from all over the the known world to come to Jerusalem to participate in this celebration. It was like Passover in that way. You had to go. You had to make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate. Secondly, it was a great holiday. No work was done. School was out. Shops were all closed. It was like Thanksgiving Day for all of Israel. So, in short, Pentecost is a great celebration of the people. The streets are clogged with pilgrims all coming into town for the great celebration. So they're all in one place. And God chooses to do this great thing. So this feast was a perfect time for what happens in Acts 2 because there was maximum exposure for what God was going to do. Now, we shouldn't really be surprised about God's timing here. We see in other places in Scripture, God had a great sense of timing. For example, when God wanted to send his son into the world, born of Mary, he waited until Caesar Augustus had issued a a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. That meant that Jewish men like Joseph had to travel to their ancestral homes to register for a new tax. So Joseph went to Bethlehem with his expectant fiancée, and the prophecies of the Old Testament were fulfilled. God's timing was perfect. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, on a donkey in what we call Palm Sunday. It was at the beginning of the Passover celebration. So he was arrested the very night of the Passover meal and then died on the cross as the Lamb of God. The day after they celebrated the Lamb who was slain at the Passover time, Jesus took away the sins of the world. God's timing was perfect. Paul says in Galatians chapter 4, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. When the time had fully come, God's timing is perfect. So God's timing in sending the Holy Spirit was perfect. But I thought about this this week. Some of you may be thinking this. What about God's timing in our lives? How does that work exactly? When I was 25 years old, about that same year when I made that trip to China, I was working my way through grad school as a substitute teacher in junior high schools in Gas City, Indiana. I don't really believe in purgatory, but that's close if there is a purgatory. I was single, searching for God's direction in my life. Uh, That year I felt very strongly that I was supposed to and that I should apply to a doctoral program out at Fuller Seminary in California. Went through the entire application process, got all the stuff I needed, all the recommendations, and I was 99.9% sure not only that I was going to get in, 
but that was what God wanted me to do, just convinced. Then I got that little thin rejection letter. I didn't get in. I was stunned, and I was angry. I felt misled, misled by God, and I told him about it. I was upset that I wasn't going to California. I was looking forward to going to California. I was staying in Upland, Indiana, of all places, for another year. And then less than two months later, in the midst of all that disappointment and anger at God, I got a job at Taylor University and had met the woman who would become my wife two years later. I learned something during that time. I learned something about God's timing. I learned, first of all, God's timing is perfect. Second, I learned, or started to learn, that we often can't see that His timing is perfect until much later down the road because we don't see how He sees. Thirdly, there's almost always waiting involved in God's timing. We see all of that in Acts chapter 2. That's the coming of the Spirit. Secondly, we see in Acts 2 the nature or power of the Spirit. The nature and power of the Spirit. A few years ago, um, an especially strong storm blew through the Fox Valley. Now, we get these storms quite often, but this one was especially strong. A lot of times, my boys and I will go outside and watch storms as they come in. They like to take pictures and video. They like to watch lightning and stuff. So we kind of, we're kind of like storm chasers in our yard. We just, we run around and we watch the storm come in. And my wife warns us to come in, but we just like doing that. But this one was strong, so we watched this one from inside the house because we could tell it was, it, was, it was frightening. All of a sudden, while we're watching out the windows, the wind just revved up within a few seconds to, to like a freight train roar. No, nothing like we'd ever heard before. So I ran to the front living room of our home and looked out the window just in time to see our driveway uh, like, look like a, half a tree was laying in our driveway. We don't have a tree there. This is right across the driveway. And I went, whoa. And I turned to the left, and I saw where it come from. There was a 10-year-old maple tree. It had to be 8, 10 inches in diameter sitting right next to our house. It was snapped in two, just snapped off like a matchstick, and it had been driven across 50 feet of our yard and was laying in our driveway. That happened in just a split second. See, when we think of roaring winds, we tend to think of that. We tend to think of destruction. We think of the disaster movies like Twister or The Perfect Storm and the one coming out in a few weeks, Into the Storm. I saw a trailer for that, like, like 747s being tossed around like they're toys. That's what we think of. Here we see a different kind of wind. Let me read it for you again. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now what's this about? What's, all, what's happening here? Well, the Holy Spirit is invisible. Spirit by nature is invisible. So God gives His young church two physical manifestations of the Spirit so that they can know that He's fulfilling His promises. First, He gives them a mighty rushing wind that they could hear and probably feel. Then He gives them fire. Now, the word for wind here is noe, which is a synonym for pneuma, which is the word throughout the New Testament used for the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself compared the Spirit to wind in John chapter 3. He says, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear the sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. In Genesis, the Hebrew word for both wind and spirit is ruah. We did a series called Ruah back a couple of years ago. It refers to both the Spirit of God hovering over creation and to the breath of life that God breathed into Adam, the first man. Here the wind of God's Spirit blows in a mighty way, but not to destroy rather to create. And what God creates is the church. And then notice there's a kind of ignition that happens. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Now fire throughout Scripture is symbolic of God's presence. Remember, God spoke to Moses out of what? A burning bush. What, gu what guided the Israelites through the desert at night? The pillar of fire. Fire brings light. is often used to describe the passion of devotion as well. Way back in the end of the 19th century, a preacher named Charles Spurgeon preached on this passage, Acts chapter 2. Listen to his language as he, descri as he describes the symbolism of fire. He writes, But fire does more than give light. It inflames. 
And the flames which sat upon each showed them that they were to be ablaze with love, intense with zeal, burning with self-sacrifice, and that they were to go forth among men to speak not with the chill tongue of deliberate logic, but with the burning tongues of passionate pleading, persuading and entreating men to come to Christ that they might live. Luke goes on to say that the wind of the Spirit filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now here he's telling us, I think, that the coming of the Spirit was a communal, a community, a group experience. They all heard it simultaneously. They all felt it all at the same time. And I think this is a a reference to corporate worship, what we do here on Saturday evenings, what we do on Sunday mornings, both campuses, what the church anywhere does as it comes together to worship. We experience something together, not a physical wind, but more of a spiritual wind when we experience the blessing, the presence of God who shows up when we praise Him. And then we read that the Spirit also filled each one of the apostles. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Spirit was experienced as a group corporately, but also individually. The Holy Spirit filled the room, but also filled each individual person. Now it's important to see what's happening here. Remember, Jesus had said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will then be my witnesses. That's what he said. This is what Jesus meant when he said, you'll be baptized by the Holy Spirit. When you receive power, he's demonstrating that. They receive the Spirit's power. They speak in languages to proclaim the gospel in languages they've never learned. But what about our experience of the Spirit, yours and mine? How are we to be baptized by the Spirit? Does it work the same way? Where's the little fire things on our heads, you know? First of all, the Bible teaches that if you put your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit already lives in you. It doesn't have to be some other supernatural event. The Holy Spirit's already in you if you've trusted Christ as, as Savior and Lord. Ephesians 1 tells us this. Paul writes, And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed... Not afterward, not three months afterward, not ten years afterward. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So that's already happened. If you're a believer, the Spirit dwells in you. Paul goes on to teach that the Holy Spirit is Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith to assure us we are God's children, to fill us with the enormity of Christ's love, to convict us of sin, and to restore us through forgiveness. Those are all activities of the Holy Spirit. So if you're a believer, this is true for you. But I believe many of us do not experience the Holy Spirit because we simply don't understand the Spirit's role and have never been taught who the Spirit is. Several years ago, a woman, uh, in fact, this story's happened to me a couple of times with different people, but a woman who was new to FBCG, brand new, uh, came in to see me on a Monday, I think. And as soon as she walked into my office, she began to get emotional. She sat down and she said, that she had come out of a different faith tradition, had just started coming to FBCG, that she thought she had always believed in Jesus, but something was happening to her. She said when she came to our church, from the moment she walked into the sanctuary till the time she left, she began to weep. She said, I'm weeping and and I'm not sad. I don't know why I'm weeping. What's happening to me? Can you help me? I told her I couldn't be absolutely sure, but what I thought was happening was that the Holy Spirit was drawing her into a personal relationship with Jesus. That's what she was feeling, was the love of Christ through the Holy Spirit pulling her into a relationship. I explained that without the Holy Spirit, all we have is a, all we have is a set of intellectual beliefs. Like, all we have is religion. Like, religion is like a car. Nice car, but there's no gas in that car. The Holy Spirit is the gas in the tank of religion. It makes it real. It makes it a relationship. In Revelation, when Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Whoever hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about the Spirit coming in to dwell in our hearts and to recreate us in his image, to make us born again. That's the power and the nature of the Spirit. Thirdly, in Acts chapter 2, we see the impact of the Spirit. The impact of the Spirit. Now, like many of you, I have uh, just a faint acquaintance with a couple of foreign languages. You know, studied a little Spanish in high school, had a chance to travel a little bit, lived in Europe for a while after college and learned a little bit of French, just enough to know some words and all that, enough to gain a, a real understanding of the power and difficulty of translating between languages and all that sort of stuff. I've spoken 
uh, through Russian interpreters and Turkish interpreters, and I, I, I love languages and have, have, have a respect for it. Once while trying to uh, give a short greeting at a church in the Dominican Republic in Spanish, because they, they learned that I had a little bit of Spanish, so they asked me to speak to this small little church. So I, I thought I'd try, and I thought about what I wanted to say, and I, 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 I had it all planned out, but I tried to say a spontaneous line. I wanted to tell them I was a little embarrassed about my Spanish, and so what I said was, estoy un poco embarazada. And that sounds good. It sounds right, right? It sounded right to me. And everybody started laughing. And what I said was, I'm a little bit pregnant. I said, right, 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 right to the church. And I've seen the beauty of language as well. When I was visiting a church in Turkey years ago, uh, I marveled as we worshiped together. Less people than are in this room, this church in Turkey. Uh, there was a, a Swedish family, mom, dad, and kids, leading worship in both Turkish and English. So get that, Swedish family singing in Turkish and English. There was a, a German pastor preaching in English while an Iranian woman translated his English into, into Turkish so the Turkish believers could hear. The congregation was made up of worshipers from Turkey, South Korea, United States, Canada, South Africa, Bolivia, Mexico, and El Salvador. Those are the only ones I can remember 10 years later. And somehow everyone there that day heard the Word of God in at least one language they could understand. I remember having two thoughts that day, two very clear thoughts. One is, this must be a little what heaven will be like. Must be a little what heaven will be like. People from every tribe, tongue, and language gathered before the throne to worship. But secondly, I thought of the day of Pentecost. Here we see that the apostles are speaking in languages other than their own. Now, a couple of things here. All these guys were already multilingual. We don't think of them that way. You know, Americans, are, we're some of the only monolingual people in the world. But these guys all spoke at least three languages. They spoke Hebrew, Aramaic, as well as Greek, and probably a couple others, most of them. But that's not what's going on here. They began speaking in languages that they did not know and had never studied. Notice what Luke points out here. Let me read this a little bit longer text. And they were all filled with the Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem. Remember, it's a festival time. People are coming from all over the place. Devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pan. See, they mentioned all these places. They all had different dialects, different languages. Almost proof that this could not have happened in any other way than by the power of God. This is a miracle of the Holy Spirit. And this is the power that Jesus talked about. You will receive power to become my witnesses. Way back in Genesis, God confounded human language at the Tower of Babel story. Remember that? Here, he does exactly the opposite. He clarifies languages for his purposes. All of them heard the gospel in their own language. It occurs to me, Jeff and I were talking about this this week, that here God simply used his own supernatural technology to speed up the translation process. Remember when Jesus turned water into wine at a wedding? I did a wedding today, which is why I'm in my wedding clothes. But when Jesus turned water into wine, he just sped up the natural process. Water becomes wine naturally, but it takes months and months and months and work and work and work. But it can, it, that's what it does. Jesus did, did it and cut out all the inter, intermediate steps. Here he does the same thing using language. Ministries like Wycliffe Bible Translators commission men and women. We have people from our congregation who do this, who've gone out to where no written languages exist in the world, and they learn a language, and then they create an alphabet, and they create written language where there is none, so that people can eventually read or hear the Bible read in their own tongue. It takes over 20 years for that process to happen, humanly speaking. Here God does it in a few seconds because he's got the technology. Just a quick word about what's called here the gift of tongues. Many of you have heard about something called the gift of tongues. Maybe you've studied about it. In several places in the New Testament, there is something called the gift of tongues as one of the spiritual gifts the Holy Spirit gives to the church and to individuals. It's usually understood as the supernatural ability to worship God uh, in a language that one has never studied or learned. It's used to encourage the church and to praise God, and it often comes with the gift of interpretation. 
It's a dramatic and mysterious gift, and when Paul talks about it, he warns the early Christians to be very careful in using this gift properly. And I believe that that gift still does exist today, but that it's often misunderstood. There's going to be opportunity later in the series in Acts to talk about that gift and teach on spiritual gifts. But what I want you to see right now is that this story is not about that gift. This is a one-time event that happened to birth the church by launching the gospel into the world. This is what God did. The point of the Spirit is not the phenomenon. It's not the wind. It's not the fire. The point is the impact, and the impact is always about Jesus and the gospel. Luke finishes the story by saying, And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? What does this mean? And that's a great question. We're going to come back to that question over and over again as we go through the great book of Acts. You're going to write it down in your journals, and you're going to ponder this question. What does it mean? What does this mean for us? What does this mean for me? It's a great question to ask as you read through any portion of God's Word. What it means here in Acts chapter 2 is that God has fulfilled His promise to send the Holy Spirit. God has fulfilled that promise. It's happening right there in real time. It means that Jesus has begun to fulfill His promise of building His church. And we are now part of that 2,000 years later. It means that we have received the Spirit as a group, as the church, the body of Christ, and as individual believers. The Spirit now dwells in us. It means the Spirit is the power to bear witness. Then in many tongues all at once, Today, with our tongues, in the language that He's given us to speak, even if it's just one, we have a tongue, we have language, we have the passion to share the story, to bear witness. Now remember, Pentecost is just a word that means 50th. It stands for the Jewish celebration that was the Feast of the Harvest. And I don't think that's a coincidence. God has perfect timing, remember. He chose that moment, that time, to say to us, you are my church. I have poured out my Spirit on you and in you, so celebrate because the great harvest has already begun. The great harvest has already begun, and you are now part of it. Acts chapter 2. Read in your journals. Read the rest of chapter 2. We'll be in it next week as we continue on in this great journey. Let's bow in prayer. Lord God, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for the gift of your spirit. Help us to allow your spirit to blow through our lives, to blow through our hearts, to blow through this, your church. And may the wind of your spirit, the movement of your spirit ignite. Ignite something in us. Ignite our worship. Ignite our service. And ignite our own witness. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.